Femtech Society, uh, we believe that in order to come up with an inno innovative solution for the outstanding challenges in female health, one must first acknowledge and understand some of the main overarching systemic issues. And gender bias has been an ongoing issue in scientific research and healthcare. With example being the underrepresentation of female individuals in early st stage research, but also clinical studies, unmet need uh, in female healthcare, um, and also discrimination in the award of research grants uh, for female health. So this complex array of, of issues often described as the health gap or the research gap. And in order to raise awareness on this very important topic and also plant the seed for future innovation and ideas into university students and researchers all the around, around the UK, we have come up with the Mind the Research uh, Gap project. So um, Vale, if you want to share just uh, our slides, our Mind the Research Gap project is composed of three uh, key initiatives. So we've got the launch event that you're attending right now. Um, and then we have a competition uh, for uh, students all across the UK that will run between tomorrow and the 8th of April, where we will ask students to submit a thousand word essay or artwork to depict um, a gap in female health and how they might want to go about addressing it. And then we'll wrap it all up on the 28th of uh, April with the Mind the Research Gap conference, where winners will also be, uh, when the winners of the competitions will be announced. And we have over 10 international speakers talking to us about um, female health research gaps. So let's now go to say a few thanks. So this project would not have been possible without the support of our student collaborators. And I'm going to say the names uh, in a random order, but I would like to thank um, the committee at the Cambridge Women in Science Society, at the Women in STEM Society at the University of Bristol, at the University of Edinburgh, the Wise Society at the University of Manchester, uh, Ox West at the University of Oxford, uh, the Imperial College Femtech Society, the King's College London Women in STEM Society, the Queen Mary University, uh, of London uh, Women in STEM Society and also the Femtech group at uh, UCL Institute for Women's Health. Um, next slide, please. And also we are extremely, extremely grateful and honored to have partnered with WAM, uh, Women Health Access Matters um, uh, on this project. They have inspired us and supported us in uh, coming up with this project and, um, and making it happen. So just a few words about WAM. WAM is a US-based not-for-profit organization that works to increase health um, awareness and funding uh, for women's health issues, and also improve the inequities and bias in research by accelerating scientific discovery in women's health in four primary verticals, brain health, heart health, autoimmune disease, and cancer. WAM has produced the WAM report, which is a series of studies that quantify the cost and economic benefits of increasing um, investment in women's health, and also examine the impact of accelerating sex and gender-based uh, health research. And with this incredible work, WAM is building a data-driven case for accelerating women's health research. So um, if we go to the next slide, uh, please let me introduce our speakers for today. So Professor Peter is an associate professor at the George Institute for Global Health and a senior lecturer uh, at the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College London. She holds uh, a joint appointment as associate professor at the University Medical Center in Utrecht. And also, and she obtained her PhD in epidemiology uh, from Utrecht uh, University and worked as a postdoc um, in Utrecht, Cambridge and the University of Oxford. Her research specifically focuses on sex differences in the prevention, presentation, management, and outcomes of chronic disease, mainly cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Her research has been supported by several prestigious grants, including a four-year strategic skills development fellowship from the UK Medical Research Council and a five-year fellowship from the Dutch Research Council. Additionally, she's a world uh, health 
World Heart Federation Emerging Leader and a Speciality Chief Editor for Sex and Gender Differences in Disease in the Frontiers Global Women's Health Journal. Let me now go to Carly Lee. She's an innovator, entrepreneur, and thought leader dedicated to improving women's health and well being. She was the founder and CEO of Carly Designs, one of the world's leading accessory brands. And after selling, successfully selling the company, Carly focused her energies on women's health and life planning. She founded Access Circles, a global by invitation network committed to bringing women um, access to leaders, resources and experiences that can really help transform their lives. And in 2018, she founded Women's Health Access Matters, WAM. Uh, Carly has since forged a research partnership with RAND Corporation to highlight the economic costs, benefits and social impacts of health research that focuses on women. Carly is also a mentor and leader in business, philanthropic and education organization. She is a past chair and foundation board chair of the Committee of 200, which is a community of the most successful women in business and a funding board member of the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. She also currently sits on the Women's Leadership Board at the John uh, Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And then let me go to Dr. Anula, a successful private equity uh, executive and venture capitalist whose background combines both deep business and scientific uh, medical knowledge with a broad clinical and industry entrepreneurial and investment experience. In 2013, she founded Exclaim Capital, an early stage venture uh, focused on catalyzing innovation for women's health. And in 2006, Anula also co-founded uh, Evolvence in India Life Science Fund, which is the very first fund in India to, to focus exclusively on healthcare and invest in Indian pharmaceutical biotechnology. Um, Anula was also previously a partner of uh, Skyline Ventures in Palo Alto, uh, prior to that, um, she was uh, with the uh, venture capital firm TVM in San Francisco, uh, and also her prior, prior positions include VP of Business Development at Genomics Collaborative, Vice President at the Global Drug Development, um, uh, Hoffman LaRoche for Opportunistic Infection in AIDS and Transplantation. Um, Anula received a BA from Harvard with summa cum laude, uh, an MD and PhD in microbiology and molecular genetics from Harvard Medical School. And additionally, she also received an MBA with distinction from Harvard Business School and holds an MPhil in pharmacology from the University of Cambridge. Currently, Anula is also uh, a vice chair and chief scientific officer at WAM, and she also serves on several not-for-profit uh, boards, including the Harvard Business School Healthcare uh, Initiative Advisory Board. So, you know, long introduction uh, for incredible speakers uh, that we're having with us today. So we'll have uh, um, the presentations uh, coming up after this introduction. We'll then have time for a Q&A at the very end. Uh, in the meantime, please keep your um, microphones on muted and send any questions that you may have uh, on the chat. Um, this um, event will be recorded uh, in their presentation section, but not in the Q&A section. Um, so enjoy and I'll pass on uh, to Prof Peters to uh, start with her presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minette, for the kind introductions and really pleased to be uh, speaking at this event. You can see my slides, right? The full screen again. Um, just checking. Okay, well, um, thanks again. Um, my name is Elite uh, Stana Peters. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist um, at uh, both Imperial College London and uh, at the Medical Center in Utrecht. And my research focuses on sex differences in cardiovascular disease. And today I will uh, be talking a little bit about my research um, and um, well, the, the data gap that I think is still uh, very much uh, persistent. <clears throat> right, uh, but I'd like to start with this image from uh, the Dutch painter uh, Rembrandt van Rijn. It's painted in 1632, uh, but I think it's still very much relevant to what we're seeing today uh, when it comes to medical research practices and medical research in general. 
because as you can see, um, not only all the um, students and the uh, teacher are, are men, but also the patient is, uh, is, is a man. Um, and that's still very much uh, the default in, in medical research. Um, and well, it's already from two years ago, but John Oliver had an excellent um, uh, show uh, addressing the biases in medicine, uh, both from the sex uh, perspective, but also from the racial perspective. And I would like to start with a clip from, uh, from his uh, talk from two years ago. Um, it starts now, hopefully. Well, medicine may yeah. be the most respected of all professions it is important to know that not everyone has the same experience when they visit a doctor i think i would have been treated completely differently if i had been male you'll hear doctors and nurses like oh they're just exaggerating Dramatic. you know and not really listening to them because it's a black person but if it's like a white person um it's just like oh my god like this is serious it's true if you are a woman and or a person of color in the US, you may well have a very different relationship to our healthcare system than a white man. So frankly, who better to talk at you for 20 minutes about this than me, the whitest of white men? <laughs> I, look, I get a sunburn watching the Travel Channel. I'm, I'm a walking cider donut, pale, filled with cake, and found at every farmer's market in the Northeast. But, but this is a discussion that we need to have, because while the vast majority of doctors are doing hard work with sometimes limited resources, bias in medicine is a serious issue. And while it's not the only factor in determining health outcomes, it can have a massive effect. So tonight, let's talk about bias in medicine in two specific areas. First, sex, and then race. And in the words of every therapist I've ever had, let's start with sex. <laughs> Right, I'll stop. Uh, I'll stop here. But I, I, it's it's really worth uh, watching, even if you don't like uh, all the jokes he's uh, he's making in this particular style. Uh, but it is true. There's still, you know, huge biases in medicine. Um, and historically, most medical research was conducted in predominantly male populations, and this has uh, a background um, dating back to, uh, well, to, to long ago. But uh, especially in the 1950s and 60s, there has been this. Uh, thalidomide uh, scandal where a drug was introduced as a sedative and medication for morning sickness in pregnant women um, without being tested on, uh, on pregnant women. Um, and the result is depicted in this, uh, in this photo because uh, the babies that were born from those um, women, many of them suffered from uh, major malformations. Um, and that, um, I think, raised a lot of caution and of uh, among the research community and for that reason many women uh, for many years have been excluded from from studies um, but and the results from those studies at that point in time were assumed to be equally relevant to women however uh, to date we actually see that that's not the case and that there's um, you know a really strong case to uh, include women um, in medical research as, as we include men um, so what I'm going to illustrate today is that uh, we can increase our knowledge about disease and improve health comes for both women and for men by, first of all, including women um, in studies and to, to ensure that there are enough women included in studies. Um, and well, this is an image from 2018, a study that was conducted where uh, the researchers looked at the participation of women in um, trials that, um, that assess the efficacy of uh, FDA approved drugs. Um, and what you can see on this slide is that um, when considering the prevalence of those conditions in, in women and in men, women were vastly underrepresented for uh, most of the conditions that were um, assessed in those, um, in those trials. Uh, so, for example, if you take um, acute coronary syndrome, um, the, women, the, the women, uh, part, prevalence to, participation to prevalence ratio was only 0.6, meaning that women were underrepresented by about 40% of the actual, clinic, uh, uh, the actual uh, clinical population. Um, secondly, uh, I'm going to talk about the need for sex-specific analysis, because even today, that's not um, common, common business. Um, and I'll, here I show the example of the reporting uh, of sex-specific data on COVID-19. Um, this is data from early in the pandemic, but you know, not much has, very, has changed throughout, at least not for um, many of the, of the countries, um, um, many of the countries in the world. Um, so even, even though from very on, onwards in the pandemic, it was clear that women and men had different outcomes, men were more, much more likely to die uh, as compared with, uh, with women. 
um, many countries, including high income countries, uh, didn't simply not report the data um, ne necessary to, um, to, to, to assess the sex uh, difference in, in, C in COVID mortality, simply because they didn't report that, uh, that kind of data. Um, and that's a persistent issue that, you know, even though the data are very likely to be available, it's simply not reported. Um, and that, um, you know, um, makes it very difficult for scientists uh, and the scientific community to actually um, do the research, but also for policymakers to, uh, to, to act upon that. Um, so I'm now going to switch to uh, my ex area of expertise, which is cardiovascular disease. Um, and also in the, in the area of cardiovascular disease, there's still this widespread perception that uh, cardiovascular disease is, is a condition that mainly affects men. Um, and while it is true that men uh, typically uh, present at an earlier age with cardiovascular disease, um, the lifetime risk of cardiovascular disease is actually similar between uh, women and men. However, as you can see on the right hand, on the left hand side of this slide, the top panel is for men, the bottom panel is for women. Um, men are more likely to present with CHD, where, um, which occurs at an earlier uh, point in life, whereas women uh, are a lot more likely to present with cerebrovascular disease, or in other words, with stroke. Um, so this perception is just um, not supported by, by the current data. And given that women uh, live longer than men, uh, the actual lifetime risk is, um, is, similar between, um, is similar in women and men. Um, there's also a widespread perception that the symptoms that um, um, the symptoms that women and men present with once they once they have um, uh, heart disease are different. Um, women, um, uh, it's often suggested that women um, are more likely to present with sort of like atypical symptoms. Um, and even even though there are indeed differences in between women and men in terms of symptoms of ACS, um, they uh, they by and large are actually uh, similar. So that's what I, what I show on this slide. Uh, the top three symptoms of, C of, of CHD in both women and men are chest pain, shortness of breath, and, um, and um, dysprias. Um, so this, this perception of, uh, of, of difference in symptoms has some, uh, is, is, supported, is backed up by, by some evidence. Uh, but like I said, by, by and large, the symptoms are, there, there's huge overlap in symptoms as well. And that's often what's not uh, being communicated well, I think, um, uh, both to patients and to, uh, and to, and to practitioners. Um, in addition to differences in presentation, um, there's also um, evidence uh, for sex differences in the association of risk factors with uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes. And that's what I show on this uh, slide. So the main, the main risk factors for cardiovascular disease, in addition to age and sex, uh, are high blood pressure, smoking, um, uh, diabetes, body mass index, high cholesterol levels. Um, and those risk factors are harmful, regardless of whether you're a man or women. However, the magnitude of the uh, association um, for some risk factors is substantially greater in women as compared with men. So what you see, for example, for heart disease, um, while the association between high blood pressure and heart disease is similar between the sexes, that's not the case for smoking and for type 1 and for type 2 diabetes, because the magnitude of the association um, is uh, for both smoking and for type 2 diabetes and for type 1 diabetes as well, substantially stronger in women as compared um, with men. Uh, so this means that we might have to treat women and men differently or that we have to have to change our diagnostic processes so that we identify high risk women at an earlier stage than we currently um, do. Um, even though there are these differences in the uh, association between risk factors and, uh, and cardiovascular outcomes, it's important to emphasize that given that men develop heart disease at an earlier point in their life, women um, still have a lower absolute risk of cardiovascular disease, even when they have a risk factor like diabetes. So that's what I show on this slide. On the, um, in the overall uh, columns, you see, the, um, you see that women, uh, on average, have about a third the risk of heart disease um, um, as compared with men. And in the presence of, the, of, 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 for, as a, of a risk factor like diabetes, they lose a, a substantial uh, part of that benefit, but they still have a lower, uh, they, they still have lower rates of cardiovascular disease. So this is an important 
message i think to um uh to to keep in mind that even though there are that women um have a have a, have a greater disadvantage once they have for example diabetes they still have a lower rates of cardio of heart disease in this um, case as compared with men um okay so now i would like to move to the explanations to those uh, for those differences in the effects of diabetes uh one explanation is uh well, well, one possible explanation is that there may be uh, differences in access to healthcare um, for diabetes, for example. And this is data from the UK. It's already fairly old, but it's still, uh, I think, very much um, accurate in terms of what, what we see to date. Um, so the, the, the UK, in the UK, there is an annual diabetes audit where they look at uh, the quality of care uh, for people with diabetes. Um, and as you can see, um, uh, regardless of sex, um, many patients, two out of five patients, do not receive uh, the care that was recommended in the in the diabetes guidelines. And secondly, one out of three patients do also not have uh, their blood pressure, lipid levels, and HbA1c levels uh, controlled. Um, and that's that holds true for both women and men. So there's you know uh, still a lot to gain there in general, but. After accounting for well various other differences between women and men, women were even less likely than men uh, to complete all the care processes as recommended in the clinical guidelines. So the, the actual uh, care delivered uh, for diabetes was even worse in women as compared um, with men. And this is not something we only see uh, for diabetes, but this is something we see across the board. So this is data from um, the US on the left-hand side, where we looked at uh, whether uh, women and men um, received um, the um, life-saving statin treatment after they had survived a myocardial infarction. Um, and again, the message there was that first of all, both women, women and men do not, many of many men, women and men do not receive those guideline recommended treatments. Um, and the second message was that women were even less likely than men to, uh, to receive those treatments. Women were 10% less likely than men to uh, to receive those treatments after having um, survived a myocardial infarction. And this is a pattern that, that didn't change um, over the almost 10 year time period that was included in our study. Um, and on the right hand side, you see data from uh, a heart failure, st a study on heart failure, where they looked at optimal treatment dosages because that's, 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 it's often suggested that women and men might benefit um, from receiving different dosages of the same treatment and that's um that was uh, shown in this uh in the, in the study on the right hand side uh, that looked at of the optimal dosages dosages of beta blockers of, of uh, blood pressure lowering medications in people with heart failure and what they found in this study was that um, women achieved their optimum treatment benefit at a lower dosage as compared uh, with men and this may be explained by sex differences in body shape um, and body fat uh, distribution with women having uh, relatively more uh, fat, but um, more fat um, stored um, at, in subcutaneous tissues. But this is, uh, I think, an area for future research because this, this is, hasn't been um, researched um, systematically uh, across the board for all medications that are currently used in clinical practice. Um, yeah, so in addition to differences in um, healthcare provision, there are also biological reasons for why women and men uh, experience di diseases differently. And as I already alluded to, uh, the differences in body um, fat distribution and in uh, well, be also BMI uh, at diagnosis of diabetes might, uh, might play a role here. Um, the slides that I, uh, the, the figure that I've uh, included here shows the uh, average BMI of women and men at the point of diagnosis uh, with diabetes, uh, and as you can see, that uh, as you can see here is that women um, at all ages, but especially at younger ages, um, had a higher BMI at the point of diagnosis with diabetes. And this was independent of their HbA1c level. So, they women for some reason uh, had to reach reach a higher BMI before they crossed the HbA1c threshold. That um, 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 yeah. Made, made them uh, officially uh, diabetic. Um, so this I think also um, important to keep in mind that there are yeah, biological reasons as, um, as to why women and men might experience diabetes and cardiovascular outcomes differently. Um, this is 
these are the last things I would like to talk uh, to talk about uh, with respect to um, the um, research. Um, because I also wanted to talk about why it's important to include women and men in uh, scientific studies. Um, and this is a study that I conducted in the China Kodori Biobank, um, where we looked at the association between parenthood and the risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And the background to this is that uh, it was often assumed that pregnancy was associated with a, with a higher risk of, of cardiovascular disease and diabetes um, in women. Um, and that's also indeed what we found in this study. Uh, but we questioned whether this was due to biology or whether it was due to effects associated with having children. So in this study, we therefore also included men. Um, and what we, what we found was that the association that we found was exactly the same in women as compared with men. So all the previous research suggesting that pregnancy was harmful um, for women in terms of cardiovascular uh, disease. Um, well, can 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 in a way be um, um, well. It, it's it's it seems that that those associations are not due to the purely biological effects of pregnancy per se, given that men obviously do not get pregnant. So I think this is a clear example uh, where we where where we show that it's very important to also if there's no biological reason to to, to assume that men well, have adverse effects of pregnancy to include men as a negative control to, um, to, to, to um, um, strengthen the findings in women. So my last slide is therefore um, um, that uh, I think that there are important differences between women and men in the presentation, etiology and outcomes of cardiovascular disease. Uh, with large databases and epidemiological approaches, you can assess those sex differences with the aim to improve both outcomes of women and men. Um, and research informs health policy and poorly conducted and reported research can lead to ineffective and potentially dangerous uh, health policies. And I therefore uh, really would like to encourage you to ensure that sufficient numbers of women are included in scientific studies and to, um, um, uh, and to embed a sexist aggregate approach in the collection and analysis and reporting of healthcare data. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, Thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Very insightful and lots of data and um, interesting points to, to take forward. So we've seen the research approach and uh, da research uh, data uh, from Prof Peters. Now we're moving to WAM. So uh, I'll just ask Marianne if she can share the slides um, and then we'll start with that presentation. Thanks. Well, thank you very much to the Cambridge Femtic Society for including us in this important conversation and project and for your very kind introduction. Um, you have all been amazing, uh, Benedetta, especially the work that you and your team have done. And <clears throat> thank you, Professor Peters, for sharing the critical work you're doing to help us close this vast research gap by focusing on sex differences. Just a few months ago, Benedetta reached out to WAM with what can only be called a campaign. Uh, she was pushing on an open door as we worked to accelerate research focused on women. I have no doubt that she and all of you, the bright minds of the next generation, with tenacity and conviction, will play a very important role in driving change. I'm Carol Lee Lee, the founder and CEO of WAM, Women's Health Access Matters a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to increase awareness of and accelerating funding for women's health research and investment, a societal and economic issue we can't afford to ignore. I'm also the founder and former CEO who started at my kitchen table and grew and built and led a global brand. And I can tell you from experience that women's health is an economic issue we cannot afford to ignore. Women were at the heart of my company, both as customers and employees, 85% of which were women. Let me start today by framing our discussion with some key data points. As in the UK, women are the majority of the US pop of the majority of the population, nearly 50% of the workforce and control over 60% of personal wealth. Women are also responsible for over 85% of consumer spending. That is more than $11 trillion and make over 80% of healthcare decisions. Now, think about the data I just outlined for you. Women drive the economy. 
My role as a CEO led me to think a lot about the economic impact of women and to see that impact firsthand. I also saw the ways that health issues could impact women's finances and careers, the effect that an illness could have on someone, on their family, on their business, and it turns out on the entire economy. Because while women drive the economy and make the majority of healthcare decisions across the globe, women are an understudied species and continue to be underrepresented in vital research. And you just heard that from Professor Peters. But that's not only the lack of investment. Just 2% of venture capital funds are invested in women owned or women led companies in the US and UK. And while Femtech is a bright spot on the horizon with interest, deals and funding on the rise, we are still lagging very far behind. As a business leader, I tend to look at problems with economics in mind, and I believe that change starts with data. And it became apparent to me that we lacked evidence and we lacked data about the economic costs, benefits, and social impacts of attention to sex and gender in health research. And that the medical research gender gap is a major obstacle to not only achieving equity, but to advancing the health and well-being of women around the world as women globally drive the economy. That gap is holding us all back, which is why we are excited to partner with Cambridge Van Tech Society to bring this conversation to you today. In the US, the National Institutes of Health only began to ensure the inclusion of women in clinical trials after an act of Congress in 1993. And it was only in 2016 that the NIH began requiring studies to use female mice in animal cells. In the UK, the Women's Health Strategy for England, released in December 2021, notes that there continues to be a, quote, overall need for more research into women's health, including looking specifically at sex differences and for greater monitoring of the diversity of research participants, including in NIHR-funded studies, end of quote. These delays have left us all with a weakened evidence base about women's health. And the impact is far reaching. It means that we're often using analysis and data that doesn't even apply to half the population, the driving force and the engines of the global economy. We know that sex and gender-based health differences and disparities exist, and that the differences go way beyond our reproductive organs. Just consider how those differences manifest in health outcomes. Women are two times as likely as non-smoking men to develop lung cancer. Women are 80% of all patients with autoimmune disease. Women are 50% more likely to die within the year following a heart attack than men. And we know that these differences and disparities exist. We can see it in the data when we bother to look, but collectively as a society, we still do not understand why. The analysis and the data clearly matters. Women are disproportionately and differentially impacted by some of the costliest diseases we face. We clearly need more research dollars and investment in both basic health research that shows these differences, as well as early stage companies focused on prevention, diagnosis, and treatment for diseases in which women are disproportionately affected. In 2018, I shared this data with a group of businesswomen to see if we could create change and, in this, and change this scenario. These incredible women were, like me, in disbelief when hearing the data and motivated to build the business case for funding research focused on women by asking, what are the economic impacts of increasing investments in women's health research? And therefore, we created WAM and commissioned the RAND Corporation to create a study on those economic impacts of accelerating research uh, in health and investment in women. The WAM report, the case to fund women's health research is an economic and societal impact analysis and is really the first rigorous data-driven study to measure the economic opportunity and impacts for funding research that specifically focuses on the health of women. We chose four areas to study which we knew disproportionately, exclusively, or differentially affected women. Brain health, autoimmune immune disease, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. The reports confirmed the disparities in funding for women's health research and showed that just 12% of Alzheimer's research dollars are allocated to projects focused specifically on women. 7% of autoimmune research rheumatoid arthritis research 
and 4.5% of coronary artery disease research. But here's some good news. It turns out that women's health research isn't just good science. It's a good investment and it yields higher returns of higher rates of return than general research. The WAM report finds a higher rate of return for research focused on women across our initial disease areas, coronary artery disease, autoimmune and Alzheimer's disease driving billions of dollars to the economy through greater equality of life, workforce and economic gains and reduced healthcare costs. The WAM report makes it clear that we can no longer ignore sex and gender, health research, and connections across diseases. This is also not just about women. Everyone benefits. Sex and gender research is the gateway to the future of medicine. Doubling the current women's Alzheimer's research budget at NIH pays for itself three times over. Adding $280 million generates $930 million in economic returns, a 224% return on investment. That's a 15% higher return than we get for general research. For every dollar invested, we get back $2 in quality of life improvements and $1.24 in healthcare cost savings. Here's some data from the report that clearly is quite profound. When we double investment for women's heart research at NIH, every dollar generates $95 to the economy. And for rheumatoid arthritis, every dollar generates over $1,700. And that makes perfect sense. When you think about it, heart and autoimmune disease take women out of the workforce much earlier on average than Alzheimer's. In the United States, doubling the women's coronary artery disease research budget pays for itself 100 times over. Adding a $20 million investment generates nearly $2 billion in economic returns, a 9,500% return on investment. Doubling women's rheumatoid arthritis research pays for itself 1,750 times over and adding $6 million produces 10.5 billion in economic benefits. If we implemented the findings in the WAM report together, we would invest just a little over $300 million and get back $13 billion through greater quality of life, workforce and economic gains and reduced healthcare costs. We're sharing this important data with researchers, economists, students, funders, entrepreneurs, advocates, policymakers, and business leaders. We're bringing leaders together across these disciplines to find new opportunities to create real change in the status quo. Fixing disparities in health research by increasing investment is in our best interest for women and men, not only for our health, but for our economy. WAM and other groups of passionate and courageous women and men, such as the Cambridge Fem Femtech Society and all of the incredible student organizations joining us today will change the future. The WAM report can be a catalyst to support this vision, vision armed with both the health and economic imperatives for action. We've just talked through some powerful returns and big numbers, but what does having all this data really mean? And how will it change our investment in women's health? As businesswomen, WAM asks, how can we continue to make decisions based on information that excludes 50% of our population, more than half our workforce, 60% of our wealth holders and 85% of our spenders. Well, we can't and we shouldn't. No CEO looking at this data could argue to blindly continue with the status quo because no business could afford it. Nor can we as morally and ethically responsible individuals turn away from these facts. Beyond quantifying costs and benefits, the WAM report is an accountability index for change, and our vision is that it offers a new platform and a new roadmap. We're only at the beginning of how the WAM report will create extensive change, and we're building strategies to achieve innovative alliances, policies, and economic impact. We invite all of you to use this data and join us in this project and this movement. You can find details on thewhamreport.org, and please share with us how you're putting the reports to use. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can email us at info at whamnow.org, that's W-H-A-M-N-O-W.org, and follow us on social media at whamnow. 
Thank you again to this wonderful group of women at the Cambridge Femtech Society for inviting us to share the WAM report with you and to collaborate with you on this exciting project. I now have a great pleasure to introduce a wonderful friend, uh, Dr. Anna Lajaya Surya, a vice chair and chief scientific officer of WAM and founder and managing director of Exclaim Capital and an alumna of Cambridge University to share her perspective on the potential of the WAM report and closing the global gender research gap as someone who's part of the academic, scientific, and investment communities. Anala, it's all yours. Thank you, Carolee. And I couldn't be more delighted that it's Cambridge that's uh, taking a leadership role in, in spurring this community. Um, you really are a movement and it's really, uh, I, I think the, a uh, call to action to this younger generation to carry on and grow this work and strive for equity uh, for women in, in the, on the research front, but also in the re reduction of that research into practice where there will be uh, usable clinical, uh, it could be tools, it could be products, it could be services, it could be medical devices, it could be diagnostics. So all of you, please uh, take this very seriously um, in, in whatever uh, part of your work uh, intersects uh, in this whole uh, the women's health ecosystem. So I was asking Benedetta uh, about who the audience was. Um, and I think that there are people from pharma, people from uh, research um, and, and many other um, groups. So for those of you in pharma, you may have noticed uh, that many pharmaceutical companies have actually divested themselves um, of women's health. It's very exciting that Merck created Organon as one of the uh, new healthcare, women's healthcare companies. However, also note that Merck divested themselves of their women's health um, activities. So it's a double-edged sword there. Um, Pfizer got out of women's health. Johnson & Johnson's women's health is only in their uh, consumer products. So think about this and, and perhaps bring this question up within pharma, um, if you're in pharma. Uh, and if you're in research, um, you may have noticed that there are very few funds for studying women's health. Um, and what we hope that'll happen. One aspect, a practical application of WAM might be that you take the WAM data to your faculty, to the funding organizations and point out um, that very small increases in the research budget could have outside impact to society. We hope that you will take this WAM data if you're in the investment community take this WAM data and talk about how this part of the economy has been ignored and talk about the vast opportunity. Um, think of the practical ways that you can use this data to your advantage. So rather than being discouraged as many people who are in women's health tell me they are, um, see this as um, one step in the in uh, a quiver, an arrow in your quiver, whatever the metaphor you want to use, um, that can spur you uh, in 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 a relevant way to change your immediate environment. Um, and in in we know this works. We know that movements, especially grassroots movements, work, and are very effective. Um, and and that is one of our hopes with this work is that it is to use a, a term that, the, um, uh, that is not from our generation, but from yours, is that you make it viral, um, and which has a special connotation in the time of COVID. So um, use virality in, to, to propagate uh, the conversations, use the WAM report as a data point, use Dr. Peter's work um, as a very important data point in why this is important. And I think it, it, we want to make sure that society understands this is good for everybody. 
Dr. Peters pointed out something very interesting where parenthood and, and uh, or it was originally thought that pregnancy was the reason why there were these increased cardiovascular and stroke um, uh, risks for women. But then when you brought the men in, you saw a very similar increase. Now that was an eye opener to me. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting example where um, in some way men have been sidelined because it wasn't known that they also had this increased risk. So this is for everybody. This is not just for women. Not that just for women should be even something I have to say because you are 51% of the population. So it should never be just for women. But that aside, it is really for everybody and it is for society. If women drop out of the workforce, which has been happening in COVID, for example, differentially from men, um, that is going to have huge impacts. Um, another thing that I want to sort of point at is that we don't know why, um, but there is a phenomenology, if you will, um, that women are um, end up not, not, not completing their treatments. Dr. Peters talked a little bit about this. We don't know why. It's easy to say it's because it's children, it, it's because they don't prioritize their themselves, their health. Uh, maybe they don't have the resources to finish it. I, we don't know why. It's worthy of studying. And then once we study it, we need to do something about it. So the purpose of the RAND report and I, would, I don't want to speak for Dr. Peters, but my message from Dr. Peters' work is we have to do something about it. So ask yourselves, what are you going to do with this information that you have today? And how can you, even in the micro, nano, pico activities, to change the environment towards uh, driving uh, change in women's equity in all spheres, but also very fundamentally in, in terms of women's health and the research that is the engine behind driving women's health. Now there's a whole ecosystem involved in taking the research to usable products, services, drugs, medical devices. So the research has to be there and all those others, other translation nodes have to be there. Think about the whole ecosystem and what you can do to advance it. This is really in your hands. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to end on uh, such a, you know, inspiring and positive note. Thank you very much Anula and Carly for the presentation. Um, so I'll now pass on, so we should stop the recording um, and move to 